Okay. <laughs> good afternoon, everybody. A good morning, I should say, everybody. Uh, I'll call this recommending meeting to order. Today is May fifth, two thousand and nine. Are we in compliance with the open meeting law? We are. Okay. Um, at this time, I would like to uh, move to our first line item of business, and that is um, Bill Number Two Zero Zero Nine Dash One Six which levies assessment for special improvement district number 1516 Fremont Street maintenance district Las Vegas Boulevard to 8th Street um, staff uh, yes councilman and committee this is a standard uh, levy uh, ordinance for a special improvement district uh, specifically a maintenance district on Fremont Street everything is in order we have uh, staff from the SID section if anybody has any questions but we recommend your approval okay uh, right now we're open uh, we'll, we'll open the item to public comment is there anyone here wishing to speak on this item if so please approach your microphone seeing none I will uh, close the uh, public comment um, councilman Steinman yes I uh, will move to uh, send this to council with recommendation for approval all in favor aye aye so moved Next line item of business is bill number 200917 updates municipal code standards and requirements for ambulance services provided by means of franchise proposed by Candace Falder acting director of finance and business services. Um, I'll open this item up for uh, comment if there's anyone here that would like to speak on this item. Uh, let me just indicate that this is a uh, change that is uh, going forward in our ordinance to correspond to an upcoming change in franchise agreement um, uh, we have mr uh, the item today is just the ordinance and when this ordinance is up for adoption you will also have the agreement come before the city council we have mr chris ware here who's our franchise officer from the city attorney's office to give you a, a very brief presentation on what this ordinance accomplishes mr ware yes council members uh, again chris ware from the city attorney's office um, Real quick background, as you may already know, um, the cities of North Las Vegas and Las Vegas and Clark County jointly um, regulate the uh, ambulance providers in our jurisdictions. Um, all three entities have been working together now for probably close to two years on some changes to try to streamline things, update some regulations, and uh, improve performance and the monitoring of performance by the ambulance companies. Uh, Clark County has actually approved these changes already, so we'll be second in line. Um, in a nutshell, the changes, uh, the biggest change involves a, a kind of a trade-off. Um, we're going to change some of the response times, and so one response time will be lowered. That will be response time for what's labeled B-level calls. Um, other response times for C, D, and E-level calls will be increased um, to the same time which is 1159 right now there's a split of, of 859 and 1259 we're just going to make that a uniform standard um, fire and rescue is quite comfortable with that fire and rescue uh, supports these changes because as as a practical matter they are really the first responder anyways um, and if AMR were for some reason on the call not to get there in time um, fire and rescue is just going to get up and go and transport the patient anyways um, so in exchange for those um, changes in the response times, um, which we deem to be a significant improvement, um, we're going to delete what is called the hospital drop time credits that the ambulance companies get. And by way of background, that's a system that was negotiated back in 2005 um, during the height of the problems with um, hold times at hospitals. And in essence, what it does was create um, in a general sense, with no disrespect to our <laughs> providers who are here today, uh, and an accounting loophole kind of, to, it, it doesn't give you a true picture of what the on time percentage is because they get credits for times when they're actually late based on a theory that the hospital drop time or hospital drop times are too much. So we're going to get rid of those credits. We're also going to get rid of um, some other just general um, waivers that AMR has asked for over the time um, for circumstances beyond their control. So for a particular call, they may just say, here's an unusual situation. 
we think you shouldn't deem this call to be late even though we were late. So again, we're, we're making it a much truer reflection of what their on-time percentage is um, from what presently is being presented. Um, we're also going to add any new requirement that AMR replace all its ambulances at 300,000 miles. Presently, there is no requirement at all. Um, so it's just a matter of whatever their internal policies are. Uh, and then finally, we're adding uh, a couple penalties and increasing the penalty on a monthly basis that if AMR is out of compliance with their response times, then the penalty will increase from $5,000 a month to $10,000 a month. So again, with the view in mind that um, things are going to be easier to monitor, they should be able to comply with these, but if they don't, there will be a higher price to pay. Uh, in a nutshell, those are the changes. Again, uh, everybody has been supportive of these. The unions that were involved, the three jurisdictions, the fire departments, uh, and as Val said, we will be submitting these hopefully on the 20th with some corresponding franchise agreement changes. Thank you, Mr. Ware. Is there anyone else wishing to speak at this time? Okay. With that being said, I don't have any comments. Councilman Steinman? I, I would just like to know, Chris, where the where the uh, uh, limit of 300,000 miles came for replacing an ambulance. I, uh, I can't even believe an ambulance will still roll at 300,000 miles. Uh, wh what's the background behind that? Since it wasn't in there before, uh, it, it just seems to me that 300,000 miles makes a total wreck of an ambulance, and I just don't understand what the motivation was behind that. That's well, a very that's a very good point too because I, I know my car is at two hundred thousand miles and it's on its last leg so yeah. that's a, that's a very good point. I, I may need to enlist uh, John Wilson's help here in a minute. Um, frankly, the best person to answer that question, unfortunately, is not in the room. That was negotiated really with the fire and rescue people, uh, and again, this is a starting point because right now there really is no standard whatsoever in the contracts. So this is a starting point, and of course, over time, if we believed it was not an adequate standard, um, we might have to go back to the ambulance companies and, and discuss a lower number than that. But having I said that, I believe our fire department has far different standards than that uh, on their particular rigs. So that's why I'm asking the question. Uh, I think that Councilman Barlow makes the point relative to his car, but the ambulances get a lot more abuse than his car, even. That's true. And I just can't, I just don't understand this at all. And uh, uh, I also had a question about response times as it relates to level C and D calls and what kind of times are expected on level C and D calls. The, the C, D, and E calls, like the B calls, will now be a uniform standard of 1159. Uh, I just, that, that'll be 90%. I don't, understand, I don't understand that one at all because. Level C and D are, are, are life-threatening calls, and you really need to be there. If you really want to do it right, you need to be there within four minutes. I know that's not realistic, but 12 minutes, I, I'm not sure I get the drift on, the, on that particular standard for C and D and E calls. So I have a couple issues here that uh, I think need a touch more explanation to me. Maybe we can do it at, at council meeting, but I'm not sure. I think we like to air all the things at, at this particular level. That's well, great. and again, if I could, um, fire and rescue, it's unfortunate they're not here, but the whole theory behind these changes is that fire and rescue has been and will continue essentially to be the first responder. Um, we are not looking at AMR to be the first responder on scene. Um, we are looking at them more as a transport company uh, they do do a lot of transports, but the people who are going to be there in the critical period um, are going to be fire and rescue. And so for that reason, um, both our fire and rescue and the other two fire departments, uh, again, have been comfortable with these changes. We are decreasing the B level time. We are increasing slightly the C, D, and E level time. But the way things are operating in the field really won't change at all. Um, and we and you know the fire and rescue folks believe that um, once you change those times, eliminate again this hospital drop time credit loophole or exemption or whatever it wants to be called, um, as a practical matter, you won't see any practical effect, and you'll get an actual true 
on time response percentage instead of um, a percentage that's kind of an accounting nightmare? Well, I, I would say this, that on a C and D and E call, there is a need for more than two, res two persons on that response unit. And that's why they send two rigs to a particular response, and that has four people. And if those two from the city get there and don't have the assistance they need on a heart attack or a stroke, it's, 12 minutes is just out of the picture. It's not even important at that point. And, that, and I think I need to talk to Greg Gammon or Chief Myers about this situation and understand, because I understand the fire department pretty well, and, and these are the questions, the two questions I have just to make sure. Now, what this does to hold this up, I don't know, but if somebody needs to explain that. If I'm asking too many questions, going to hold this up, when can we get the particular answers to that before we move it on? And, and council member, I think those are very legitimate questions, and I agree with you. Frankly, Greg and Mike would be better people to discuss that with probably than, than I am. Oh, I, I'm sure they are. I'm sure they are. And I'm, I'm going to actually be with with Greg later on today, so you know I can ask these questions, but uh, I want to know how you want to time this to move it forward. Is there a sense of urgency that it has to be done, you know, on the on the next council meeting when this is going to come up, or can we get answers on the record at, at a recommending committee a meeting that we will have in two weeks so that we can get this moved on at that time? That's all I want to know. Can it be delayed? A couple of weeks for these answers on the record well th there is some I sense of urgency uh, and, and please yeah, come on. councilman john wilson from american medical response i'm the general manager uh to answer your first question about uh vehicle mileage um the ambulance companies employ uh aircraft standard maintenance um so we have a very aggressive preventative maintenance program each ambulance averages about fifty thousand miles per year um, and we expect uh, the ambulance to go uh, five to six years before we move it into uh, what we call code two service. Um, during that time, we, we aggressively replace any part before it fails to minimize any possible critical failure. So unlike uh, what happens in a uh, standard personal vehicle, these are obviously commercial vehicles. Um, much like your fire department has, uh, has semi trucks um, that are really built for a million miles. Um, our vehicles, um, working with Ford, um, are 300,000 mile uh, vehicles. That is the intent behind them. That's what the motors are built for um, with the aggressive maintenance programs that we, we employ. Um, we don't hesitate whether it is uh, motors, transmissions, uh, any of the support structures, uh, suspension, brakes, we will replace the entire uh, part to it. Um, but we expect that the vehicle will last um, between five and six years in, in very good condition with our maintenance program um, without any question whatsoever. Um, as far as the issue of the response times, what we are talking about here is a measurement dis uh, change um, that takes away hospital exceptions um, and some other criteria that were important to the fire departments. They wanted to get to a gross compliance standard. Um, I will tell you that the mission is slightly different between uh, the ambulance company and, and the fire department. The ambulance companies deploy our resources more similarly to what the, the police department do when uh, you have a fluctuation in uh, population. Obviously, um, during the day, we have more people in, in, uh, uh, in the business sectors of the community, less out in the suburbs, so we deploy ambulances to follow the flow of people um, and we staff our, our units uh, by our day and day of week based on historical call demand. Um, <clears throat> the fire department um, has their station strategically deployed, obviously, and they guard the buildings and the people that are within those buildings. Um, it is an exceptionally good system that we have in place here. Um, the, the community is very well served. We have, we're a very rich system where we have dual paramedics, both on the fire service and the private ambulance, um, and the patient is guaranteed to get advanced life support very quickly because our units are, our private ambulances are roaming the city based on demand patterns, and the fire departments are based on geography. You get the best of both worlds. And what we're trying to reflect within this ordinance 
is the partnership that we have with the fire department um, and recognizing their role as the first responder, the primary first responder, but still recognizing that the private ambulance companies will likely arrive on scene uh, first between 35 and 40% of the time, uh, just because of how we redeploy our resources during the day. Um, <clears throat> I understand your concern on the 8.59 clock. Um, the standard has been out there for many years. We've, over the years, pared down and, and parsed down the, the exceptions or the reasons why an ambulance uh, could possibly um, ha be excused for a long response. And we're going to a unified standard for all emergency responses of 1159 um, with the expectation that our fire department partners will be there with us to make sure the patient always gets a uh, rapid response. Is there an issue uh, within the city over who transports? The issue right now is uh, there is not, the, the fire department has uh, made a commitment to have their rescues transport two patients per day. That is the commitment that uh, Chief Gammon and Chief Myers have made um, to keep the, the system economically stable. Wait a minute, now did you say two per day for the whole department or no, two per rescue? rescue? Per rescue, sir. So that's about, uh, I believe they have 19 rescues. It's 38 transports a day. Yes, and that's about where it'll run, about anywhere from 25 to 35 a day. That's where it runs. Correct, Councilman. And I bring this question up because I watched the whole thing, the whole proceedings you had with the county. And over there, it was a different issue. And over there, the county does not transport generally. You do all the transports. And in that, in that particular uh, hearing, I heard your people say that they've had to lay off people. And I don't, maybe you want to expand on that, but when I hear they're laying off people, to me, that affects then response times and not as many uh, units being deployed. And, and I just want to know how that affects us in the city. Well, I appreciate the question, Councilman. Um, I may have misspoken in that. We, we did not lay off any, anybody. We were very proud of the fact that we have not laid off anybody. Um, what we did say is that uh, through attrition, we had downsized because the, the volume had, uh, specifically in the county, um, had trailed off as the strip was not being filled. And we had uh, downsized year over year 32 positions. Uh, many of those were, were non-emergency responses, uh, EMT positions. Um, I will, I'm very proud to tell you uh, that we have just uh, begun hiring again. We have an orientation class in uh, finishing up right now uh, that has eight people in it. Uh, so we are actually seeing some signs of recovery back in Las Vegas. Uh, the issue in the um, in Clark County specifically, Councilman, <clears throat> was that we were rather surprised. Um, the The bill that was proposed was from the fire department union. Um, the county uh, commission and county management um, had not communicated with us that they were supportive of this, and it came at us from a, a different perspective. Uh, we have sub, uh, subsequently come to an agreement with them. Um, but I do want to tell you, Councilman, that there has always been, in the 15 years that I've been running ambulance services here in, in Las Vegas, there has always been an understanding that if the, the fire department responds to what we call one of their own, uh, so a firefighter or a member of, of uh, city government, uh, they will transport those folks. If there is a delay for any reason um, on a, in an ambulance response and the patient is critical, the fire department will transport those patients. And also, in the event of multi-casualty incidents, we all pitch in together and we do amazingly well to provide great care in this community. And those have never been an issue in any of the jurisdictions anywhere in this valley, including Clark County. Um, Clark County's issue is, is an issue of state law and Dillon's rule where uh, the county is not able to bill for service without specific uh, authorization from the state of Nevada and the state had uh, the state had actually given Clark County the authority in the event of a service delivery interruption of ambulance service back in the 2001 legislative session um, the county did not pass the ordinance to enable them to bill and so the fire union took it upon themselves uh, to propose legislation uh, that they brought forward this this session uh, to empower them to be able to bill for service okay now yeah. Uh, Council Barlow, I'm sorry I've taken so much of your time. Here. No, you're fine. You're absolutely fine. I think that uh, there are there are, there are some issues here, and and I just 
want to be assured from uh, Greg and Mike that uh, they're okay with this and what the standards are going in here makes sense. And that's all I was trying to do here. So I, I'm ready to wrap this up, but I, I want to I want to see if we should continue this discussion or because I know we don't discuss these when they get to council. They're, they're, they're not that, public hearings. That, I that, guess we can discuss them. That, that's a very good point. Um, how is it how is it that we can bring this forward for discussion versus um, it being approval uh, the, the, coming forward with, as, as far at as the city approval. council meeting the mayor is free to entertain all the public hearing he wants on a bill okay uh, he typically doesn't because there's a meeting to conduct and he wants to leave eventually okay so this is the primary hearing but if, but if he knows that there's going to be a discussion on this bill you then, know, he's perfectly then this is, capable then of this is what I'll, then, then this is what I'll recommend for this for the sake of my my, my councilman who has questions I'm going to uh, recommend councilman Steinman that we move this forward uh, to council um, with um, no recommendation yeah. and also request that we have this item up for discussion at the um, at the next council meeting this is to be heard that will be my recommendation and i would i would i would second that and hope that uh, mike myers and chief gammon at least could be there for that discussion unless i discuss it with them ahead of time and get all these cleared up okay we can do that all right i second that okay okay uh is there anyone wishing to uh come forward and speak to this item it is open for public comment hearing none seeing none um, as a matter of fact, Councilman, you would have to make the recommendation. <laughs> I, I, may, I will make the recommendation to send this forward to Council without a recommendation uh, and for further discussion with Council. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So moved. Okay. And now we're down to the uh, area of the meeting. Citizens participation public comment during this portion of the agenda may be limited to matters within the jurisdiction of the committee No subject may be acted upon by the committee unless that subject is on the agenda and is scheduled for action If you wish to be heard, uh, please come to the microphone give your name for the record the amount of discussion on any subject as well as the amount of time and uh, Any single speaker is allowed may be limited. Is there anyone at this time from the public? Hearing none seeing none uh, this I will move to uh, close the recommending meeting Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Simon, thank you. Have a good day. All right. Thank you. Bye.